Now, can you all hear me? No problem? A good friend, I guess it was on Monday, and former chairman of the department, shook my hand. He said, now let me see. Tell me, have I got this right? He said, um, we flew you out from Kansas City, and we brought you in here, and you are going to give us a lecture about Soviet soldiers in the German army, and we're paying you to do that. He said, have I got that? Have I got that right? And I said, you've got it right. He was asking me in his own way, who cares, you know? What is the relevance of Soviet soldiers in the German army in the time frame from 1941 through 1945? It's kind of like what my, my friend Rick Atkinson uh, mentioned today. You know, some of us do history, some of us read history simply because it's fun. But on the other hand, you read, you study history, as did Eisenhower, because you learn something from it. And that's the point of today's lecture. And the point of the lecture is the fact that you all know, or God, I hope you know, most military people and most good political leaders should know that when you get ready to do something, you need to have a objective a goal before you initiate anything. You say, huh, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, I can give you any number of examples of military operations when, as they were initiated and when they were concluded, you say, what was the point, you know? What was the objective of this whole thing? Sometimes people forget that. Anytime you have any kind of a political or military initiative, you need to have a goal, an objective. And also, the second part of that is, that should be achievable. You should do an analysis to ensure that you have the necessary resources in order to achieve what your established objective, uh, what, it, what it is. Both military and political leaders should focus on these goals. And sometimes in the course of a military operation, of course, your goals may alter or change. But you never should lose sight of those. And now this was uh, emphasized. You remember Art Lickey and Art Lickey's writings? Yes? Art was my mentor when I came here on the faculty as a major, which was really fun when everybody else was colonels. But nonetheless, Art always told us through his writings a variation on this. Yeah, you've got to have goals. You've got to have objectives. But he says also, as a part of the analysis, you think about this thing of ends, ways, and means to ensure that you know, you know where it is that you're going and that you have the necessary resources to accomplish it. And back again to the point. And the point is, looking at the Russian campaign initiated by the German army, July 22nd, 1941, gives you a classic example of someone who has goals, but at the same time, goals that, were they really achievable? Well. When Hitler initiated his Operation Barbarossa, you know, if you look at Hitler's 1924 book, Mein Kampf, and you read through that turgid prose, and my God, it's turgid, but if you read through that, or even the little better organized, but still kind of turgid, 1928 book called Hitler's second book, you can see from the onset through his writings, primitive as they are in style, or through the many speeches that he gave starting in 1919, 
he had goals. And one thing about his goals, one thing about his objectives, is they were consistent. Many of his speeches he gave in 1920 were not all that different from the speeches he gave in 1941. Same things, goals, consistency, consistency, and what he wanted to achieve. And in those speeches and in books, he emphasized the necessity of doing something with that menace in the East called the Soviet Union. A lot of consistency. He knew what he wanted to do. But think about it. We choose goals, but they need to be achievable goals. And so what were his goals as stated in speech and in writing? Military defeat, not a negotiated peace settlement, a total defeat of the Soviet army in the field. Secondly, not just the army, but a destruction of the Soviet Union as a state as he knew it at that time. It's got to disappear from the map. The Union of Socialist Soviet Socialist Republics. Massive annexations of Soviet territory, because after all, if Germany is going to live, if Germany is going to prosper, Germany needs land and Germany needs natural resources. And that can only, he says, that can only be achieved in the East. Where's the East? Soviet Union. So, destruction of the state, military defeat, massive annexations, and of course, as a part of that, you're going to keep some of those people around, some of the Soviet citizenry. You keep them around because, you know, somebody's got to do the dirty work, frankly. But for a lot of them, they're, go they're going to be displaced. Take them, they go to the other side of the Ural Mountains. Keep some around to do the dirty work. But the essence of why you got to do this, why you have to conduct this campaign, is the root, the root of communism, which Nazi ideologists talk in terms of as Jewish Bolshevism. You've got to destroy it, and the reason you've got to destroy it is because it threatens Western civilization, not just German civilization, Western civilization. And so he enunciates in various speeches and writings, here's what we've got to do. We've got to do this. Of course, the campaigns against various countries start military campaigns with the invasion of Poland on 1 September 1939, and you proceed through campaigns in Scandinavia, low countries, France, so on. All of that is something that he feels has to be done, but it's never far from his mind. This is the big crusade. It must be done. And so he initiates that campaign on the 22nd of June, 1941, and that ends up being, you know, in terms of the immensity of you know, the exercise of military power, most unbelievable campaign in the history of warfare. On that morning of the 22nd, across a 1,500-mile front, you have over 3 million soldiers moving forward. German Air Force moving forward. Unbelievable, particularly that first six, eight weeks, unbelievable victories. So therefore, within 24, 30 hours, in the air, German army, in the air on the ground, I should say, destroy over 1,800 aircraft in that brief amount of time. Total surprise against the Soviets. Complete surprise. And from June in through the late fall or early winter, it's like one success after another success after another success. Now, certainly, there are some reverses. Big one coming first week in December, I think the 4th of December, 1941, when the Soviet counterattack occurs. But up until that time, it's constant 
constant victory after victory. And so you look at a map like this, and you see here's this workshop. Here's the original, original line. German and Allied forces moving forward. And there's a problem with this. There's a problem with this. Although you have preparedness on the part of German armed forces and their allies, they're well-trained, well-equipped at the time of the attack. But consider that if I move from here out to here, and if I consider my scale here of miles, which is probably kind of blurry back there, right? But if I look at the immense size of this area, guess what? Somebody, somebody has to get food and supplies into this area. Somebody has to garrison the towns. Somebody has to provide basic services for not only German troops, allied troops, but in addition to the citizenry that live there. So victory sometimes doesn't really give you what you need in terms of military power. So thus, by the late fall and early winter of 1941-42, the German army finds itself to the point of being, despite so many victories, it's stretched. What the Germans are surprised about, many of them, is the fact that as they come into uh, Belarus, as they come into the Ukraine, into the Baltic states, is the, the reception they get from people. This is a press photo taken in 1941, July time frame. So uh, German soldiers going into an Estonian town and you can see, they got flowers on. They didn't put them there. The population did. And you can see the one soldier there, you know, on my, my right, he's got flowers. He's looking back there saying, hot damn, I hope we stay here tonight. You know? <laughs> Eyes are locked, you can see. I mean, this is not uncommon. And the, so, uh, the, the German soldiers were quite surprised about this. Heinz Guderian, for example, as he goes with his armored column, you know, he gets into this town and you know, people come out of their, their houses and they virtually cause the car to stop and they bring him fresh water, bread, milk, you know, feed the German officers before they go on. Unbelievable. German soldiers can't fathom this, you know. They're dealing with Jewish Bolshevists. You know, they're dealing with subhuman people, Slavs, and they're happy to see them. But th there's another thing, too. Even as people are welcoming them, the propaganda machinery begins to crank out. Just the opposite. This is a propaganda poster from the period, passed out to the soldiers, posted in various locations, in uh, Germany, here's our enemy. Caption says, Soviet culture. You know, this is the kind of people we fight. Soviet culture as compared to our culture. So from the onset, you have two divergent things hitting German soldiers. The propaganda about Slavs, Jewish Bolshevists, and the reality on the ground, which is shortage of, of manpower and the fact, hey, these people like us. These people like us. A fellow who used to be the military attaché in uh, Washington from, uh, from the German army uh, as a young officer in a uh, uh, mountain division, every time he would come in to a city in southern Russia, he would call out the mayor and say, I don't have the troops. You want schools open? Open schools. If you can rebuild the church that's been used as a grain silo, open your church. Get together your police force and you maintain order. We can't do it. Well, 
It only gets worse in 42. Because, again, as you look at the advance of the German forces, they're not quite to Moscow. They get close to it at the end of 41. But the advance in 42 stretches them out even further as they hope they can get to such places as the Maikop oil fields and uh, uh, Baku in order to get fuel for their starving vehicles. Do quite well here. Right there is the highest peak in the Soviet Union. There you see it. Mount Elbrus. Nine-man patrol is given orders. We've got to show people we're close to victory, to achieving, you know, at least some of these goals. So they send a nine-man patrol with a swastika flag to climb that mountain. And the guys go up there. And I spent one night talking, interviewing to one of those guys. And I remember most of it, but he was a traditional mountaineer, you know, schnapps beer, schnapps beer. All night long he talks, you know. And so anyway, they get up there and the snow is blowing, you know, it's, the weather's horrible up on the peak. Plant the flag so German propaganda can say, see, we are achieving the Fuhrer's goals. Okay? The flag is on the highest peak. That's the false peak. They didn't know it because of the, of the uh, storm that was going on up there. But nonetheless, we are achieving those goals now in 42. But the problem is the size of that country, the immensity of the goals, and the fact that, look at the original plan. How long did it take us, the German army, to defeat France? Hmm? Plan is for the traditional German way of war. A rapid, violent, decisive victory. So that by the end of 41, we can be essentially through with achieving all of those goals. You know, that's at best optimistic. At best optimistic. Two, three months, it didn't happen. And casualties continue to mount. Franz Halder, a well-known and respected German general officer, uh, Halder starts in his diaries, which, by the way, they're, they're available in English, and he says, you know, as I look at it, this is like in July of 41, he said, look at our casualties. Every month we lose 50 to 60,000 soldiers. Now, that's not casualties. These are people that are either KIA or else are so severely wounded they'll never be back in uniform. And on top of that, then you've got the wounded, you know, that are going to be in hospitals. But every month that happens. So he says, you know, I'm not sure we can achieve this. I'm simply not sure. And think about the fact that in January of 1942, the German army had over 3 million POWs. POWs who need, well, at least some food, maybe some basic shelter, medical facilities, and so on. But how are you going to give that to them when your army is so badly stretched out? And, and the answer to that is you don't. There's a, you weren't supposed to take pictures if you're a German soldier in POW type camps. That was forbidden. But you know how soldiers are. So... This is out of an album of pictures, World War I vet who ends up being back in uniform and has a camera with him and sneaks pictures. There's one. That's the shelter offered for the Soviet winter. Okay. Scoop out a little bit of dirt. That's it. And no food. And certainly no medicine. So therefore you have scenes like this from the same camp. People are starving to death, have very little clothing, no medicine, miserable conditions. It's easy to do because in some ways, if you are bombarded by Nazi propaganda, right, 
and you're dealing with subhumans and they're Jewish Bolsheviks, you can say, oh, well, they're going to die anyway. So why worry about it? But the fact is, so many of these people show a willingness to fight against the Soviet Union. Why? Because that Soviet system, the system under Stalin, has been so brutal towards the Soviet people that in spite of the fact that you have a foreign army on, on Soviet soil, many people make the choice. There's a book comes out by a former German officer, and he talks about people looking at being against two evils. Which evil is the worst? The evil of Stalin and his regime or the evil of Hitler? Well, the Soviet citizen knows full well about the brutality of Stalin's regime. So many of them, despite this sort of thing, many of them think, well, you know, if they will help us, if they will help us destroy Stalin, it will be worth it. We'll work with them. So there comes a category in German records, a category of soldiers called Heavies. And Heavies are Hilfswillige. They're volunteers, people who are willing to help. And at first, they are used as, you know, they're used in the kitchens. They can drive trucks. They can unload and load supplies. They can do all kinds of non-combatant duties. That's fine. Carrying a rifle? Well, I don't know about that. But nonetheless, units have heavies. How many do they have in 1941? How many do they have in 1942? We don't know. Some German records will mention, you know, the fact that they have some heavies. Many find it better not to mention it at all, because after all, these are people who are subhuman. Can you trust them in the rear area? Can you trust them with food and supplies for German soldiers? Can, can you trust them around weapons, even though they are not carrying them? So they're not officially accepted into German for, uh, service in some cases. They exist, in some cases, they don't exist. But the manpower shortage for an army that is given unreasonable goals, unachievable goals, and yet at the same time, even though the Nazis say, we can't trust these people, we can't use them, we're, we're bound and determined to destroy them by goals, they also put out propaganda like this. Well, you recognize the face there, the mustache, right? Caption, Hitler the Liberator. He'll liberate us from the evils of Stalin. Postcards, posters go up. In spite of the fact that the goal is let's destroy this state, its army, its political system, let's annex you know, unbelievable amounts of land, still the propaganda machine says, Hitler's a liberator. He liberates you from Stalin. You get all kinds of con conflicting information put out to German soldiers and to the Soviet citizenry all through this time frame. Now, Hitler, at the start of the campaign, a couple of weeks into it, says very clearly, this is a German crusade. We're going to do, and you saw the list, these are our goals. And as it is a German crusade, nobody but the German can carry a rifle and can participate in this. Well, but then again, look. By the end of the same year, the same man who has unbelievable prejudice against not only Jews but Slavs, the same man then come back and comes back and says, with the urging of his military leadership, he says, well, okay, you know, Soviet Union, what, has 132, 133 nationalities, okay? So we don't like the Russians, but you can have a legion to help you, and that legion could be composed of Georgians, you know? 
because they're kind of a separatist type people and they're fierce and warlike and we can use them. They're not real, they're not real Russians. So make up a legion. And you can have Armenians and you can have Caucasians. Any, anybody from the Caucasus is fine. Turkestanis. And at the same time, the favored of all. The Tsar's Praetorian force. Cossacks. The Cossacks. They are acceptable. Why are they acceptable? With Hitler's confused logic. These, some of these people, to include the Cossacks, they're warrior-like people. In fact, any Muslim is fine. Because it's a Muslim, according to his readings, in Muslim literature, you know, fighting and warlike uh, uh, characteristics, they're everywhere. We can use those people because they're not real Bolsheviks. They're not real Slavs. So if you want to have a legion composed of these people, that is fine. And so it begins as unofficial, semi-official, all through the war because of a failure on political leadership to establish achievable goals. You have people who want to fight for the Germans and the Germans having to accept them. These people have their own goals. Ivan Kononov. For example, the uh, colonel pictured here, Kononov is a product, product of the Soviet system, but he has also suffered under Stalinism. And so in 1941, one day he gets, gets his uh, battalion together at the end of the day. He says, soldiers, tomorrow morning I'm going over to the Germans. I want to destroy Stalin. Those of you that want to come with me, you can come. And if it makes you feel uncomfortable, you can stay here and be a part of the Soviet army. He takes his battalion with him to the man. Are they pro-German? No. They have all suffered under Stalin. And so you find a convergence of, you know, goals, I guess you would say. A group of Soviet citizens, large numbers of Soviet citizens who are dedicated to their country. They're not pro-German, but they hate Stalin. And then at the same time, you find the Germans who, though they are by goals, you know, they're, they're, they're dedicated to destroying the Soviet state and the Soviet people, the Germans have got to have manpower because the goals established by their political leadership are unrealistic. Unachievable. So Ivan Kononov, coming in from Paris, Belgrade, for example, you have people like old Peter Krasno, who's in his 70s. He had been a general during the Russian Revolution. He had been in exile since 1920 or so. Wrote a, wrote a book that was widely read in, in the Western world at that time. And when the Germans attack, he comes back and recruits through the European cities out of the emigre, Russian emigre population, population. He recruits troops for the Germans. And some of the religious leadership is very happy about this because one thing about the Germans, the Nazi, Nazi, Nazi regime is, is you know, essentially anti-religious, but that's one war too far you know, in the future to worry about. And a lot of your German soldiers, German officer leadership, they have religious ties. So they open up churches everywhere, anywhere the Germans go. And so a lot of religious leaders do the same thing. They throw in with the Germans. And by 1943, it, and 40, 43, 44, it becomes even more perplexing how you, you know, how you rationalize all of these counter currents within both the Soviet citizenry and the German political system, the German army, because you have people like Andrei Andreevich Vlasov, a great Russian to the core. 1941, he is one of the defenders of Moscow. 
and as a result of his brilliant defense of Moscow, he is personally decorated by Stalin as a hero of the Soviet Union. He goes over the Germans. Why? Because he's suffered. He's profited under Stalin, but at the same time, he's suffered under him as well. He, his father, when he launches an offensive in 1943 against German forces that have ringed the city of Leningrad, his wife sends him a note. Personally tasked with relieving Leningrad, okay? His wife sends him a note, and it says, guests have come. Guests have come. Soviet secret police, while he's launching an offensive for Stalin, searches his house all through his papers, turns his house upside down. Nobody, nobody is, you know, isolated from the terror that Stalin exacts on his people. And you have German officers, and particularly people within the officer corps, who have strong ties with the East. Take this fellow, for example. Helmut von Panwitz. Panwitz grew up along the border of the German Empire and the Russian-occupied area of Poland in the time frame before World War I. And Panwitz spoke Polish quite well. He spoke Russian very well. And he is bound and determined, even though he's a CAV officer, German officer, career officer, he is bound and determined Somebody has got to change our policies, and somebody has got to get us allied with the Soviet peoples so we can get them a better life and also so we can avert military disaster. Pan Panvitz, when he gets his, uh, I think it's when he gets his uh, Knight's Cross, is per personally presented with this decoration by Hitler. And he takes the opportunity to say, our policies, our goals in the East are wrong. We've got to enlist these people officially. They've got to be treated well. The POWs can't be left to starve. He goes on and on, and Hitler just kind of, you know, what is this man doing to me, you know, and then walks on. Doesn't say anything, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, you know, try to have him arrested or anything. I think it is a real shocker. But in any event, Ponwitz, uh, is one of the, they call them, the other Germany group. It's the Germans who have really strong appreciation for Russian culture, the peoples of Poland. They like the Slavs. They like Russian literature, Russian music. And uh, he becomes a real leader. By the end of the war, Panwitz will command a corps, actually two divisions with a third forming, of people composed of either Cossack or various other nationalities. They will be one of the last German units. Not, you can never say the last, the first, or anything, if you're a historian. But they will be one of the last German combat units to, to surrender. They come from all kinds of backgrounds. Sometimes the Germans give them first-class training, Sometimes they give them just weapons. Sometimes first-class German weapons. This particular situation, you see Russian soldiers, and they have all kinds of Soviet weapons. They wear German uniforms. Their insignia are both the same in some instances, and others, they're different. You never know. Mishmash. I don't know how you figured who you saluted or who you didn't because the insignias were so radically different. But, and then it goes, you not only have volunteers from the Soviet nationalities serving in the German army, but you get into the flights of fantasy because of, again, goals unrealistic goals. Here's soldiers from the free India, 
Legion, British POWs who were brought back into Germany, allowed to wear traditional headdress, given their own insignia, and encouraged to fight alongside the German army for freedom for India, freedom from Bolshevism, whatever you want, you know. Just get the necessary manpower. A lot of queer German officers are caught up in this. I spent a couple of days with this guy. He's a veterinarian and the German army was partially mechanized in 1941, never fully mechanized. By 1944, they're creating not just cav regiments, cavalry divisions, full divisions. And so you have to have guys like this, delightful person. He's a veterinarian, you know. They feel them by the, the absolute thousands because they're going back to horses. They don't have the proper fuel or the correct number of military vehicles. And you get the old guys who come in. This guy's out of Paris, you know. Russian revolutionary from the, from the time frame of 1917, 1920, and now he is in German uniform. So again, what is the point of all this? All these people who served. There's my friend Krasno again. Russians picked up a lot of these people, but Krasno was slick. How he managed to get out, I don't know. He was on the list. He ended up after the war in Australia and lived, died there of old age. Yeah. Clever guy. But the point of all of this then, and there's the last time I saw a good bunch of those guys together, that's German cadre from the Siberian division. Yeah. Great reunion to attend. Never bought a meal, never bought a drink, never bought anything for four days with these guys. They stayed up around the clock talking about their experiences with the people from the East. You know? Soviet soldiers in the German army, only way they could keep fighting till 1945. When you come to 1945, May 8th, it is estimated there were still close to one million soldiers in field gray uniform, whose ancestry was in the Soviet Union. They were still fighting, but they had no choice. They fought against Stalin, and Stalin on May 8th was the winner. What would you do? Hide? 